Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. So I was scouring eBay for some new review and demo pieces, and I ran across a very strange guitar, among a couple other ones that I want to talk about. But let's start with this. 1983 Gibson Les Paul One of a Kind A++++ by somebody who's been on eBay for quite some time, has good feedback, but just looking at this photo, no, no, <laughs> that can't be real, can it? So let's give it a good once over here. First off, we have a finish that you just wouldn't normally see in 1983. In 1993, there is dark wine burst, and sometimes they would come out kind of looking like this. So is it a typo in the title, 1993 versus 1983? Maybe, but let's keep going here. Something just doesn't quite look right about the proportions of everything right here. The fretboard, uh, I mean, it, it's close, but something also just seems off there. We can't see too much of the headstock right now, so let's not judge that quite yet. But then our next photo, it's like, whoa, all of a sudden we have centipede burst, but instead of blue on the middle, it's red. But this is the first photo where you can really tell there's a large gap right here between the neck pickup and the neck itself. You don't normally see that on a Les Paul Custom. The next photo, it looks like it's got some wear and tear, like a small chip in the lacquer right here. But then this photo, I mean, if I just saw that, I mean, I think we're all thinking it at this point, right? It's some sort of a Chinese replica. This cannot be in 1983. Because 1983s would not have a Gibson Custom Shop decal on the back like that. Even as blurry as this photo is, we can tell. This photo doesn't tell us too much, but it starts to look okay. But then this headstock shot, oh no. <laughs> so we've got a weird wonky looking nut. Our tuners are too far in the headstock to be correct. I mean, you can just tell the angles are all weird. Our custom block inlays look okay, but like slightly just too small. Or maybe it's because these tuners are infringing upon its territory. And then that logo is just so terrible. However, some late 1930s Gibsons kind of have a headstock that looks similar to that. Like here you can see this. Obviously, it's a little bit better spaced and proportioned. You've got your old pre-war Gibson style logo. But you see how it's kind of goofy looking? This one gives me vaguely similar vibes. But somebody was clearly trying to emulate the Norland era style logo. And then our, our binding's just, just not quite right on this. The layers just aren't even in every location like it goes too far right there it's too wide in this area you look through the rest of the photos you can see the pots have been replaced it just looks even more strange and weird every single photo angle here so i was ready to just write this off as a chinese replica probably wouldn't have bothered even showing it on the show however i actually don't think that is the case on this one it's kind of what the seller is saying it is, but only kind of. And I probably wouldn't have looked into this any further if they didn't have these photos at the end. So it's on a workbench, yeah, somebody's been setting it up. But then, oh, they have everything taken off of it. They're showing us neck blanks. <laughs> Like, I just thought this was like some counterfeit guy, like making replicas, trying to sell them as the real deal, and he accidentally uploaded the photos. I swear there was one more photo after this that's since been deleted, but I could just be remembering incorrectly. But that was kind of strange to see here. So I had to read this guy's description. So he says, our serial number is 803321, which uh, if you try to read that, it is kind of mind blowing. It was made in 1983 on the, the zeroth day. <laughs> January 0th? I, I... Okay, that can't be right. But seeing a serial number here, but not seeing one on the backside of the headstock with a late 90s style custom shop logo, just made me scratch my head there. But then this answers it. The serial number is located in the cavity only and is that of a 1983 Les Paul standard converted to a custom. Originally conceived by a former Gibson custom shop employee as his personal guitar. So then I went back to this photo and yeah, sure enough, it looks like it's right there. So it's been a long time since we've talked about this on the channel. There's early reissue style guitars like Kalamazoo built Leo's reissues that had the serial number stamped right here in the rim of the control cavity. It was a traditional serial number, whereas the neck one would have like LI, XXX ink stamp. And there's a few other prehistoric reissues that did that same thing. Those are very rare and desirable. So seeing that, and looking at the back of this body, the proportions looked about correct. So let's read on here. 
He says the neck is custom and hand carved to 83 Les Paul custom specs with a three piece mahogany neck. You can still occasionally find maple because late 1982 is when they start to transition back into there. So that's definitely the new 83 specs at that point in time. Got custom ebony fretboard, mother of pearl block inlays. That explains why they just don't quite look right. But then he tells us what we've seen in the photos. No serial number made in USA stamp on it and has the Gibson Custom Shop logo, even though that has no place being on that. So he's saying all the hardware, wiring harness, pickups and everything is original equipment manufacturer. So if we actually look in here, it does appear to have at least a 1980 dated pot. I can't tell what year in 1980 though, that one's a little bit too covered up and the other ones aren't visible in this photo. So I mean, it's possible those are 1983 dated pots. However, as far as the pickups, I would guess those are probably modern, but we don't have enough photos to say for sure. Because if you look at the case, that's actually a 90s case. So yes, it's original Gibson, but not era correct to this particular guitar. And he also says Gibson recognizes the serial number and is on file. That's incorrect. I mean, Gibson has no records of the 80s serial numbers. I mean, if you're trying to get help past 1989, they can just tell you whether that serial number is possible. They don't actually have a database for those, in my experience, unless they found that within the past year or two. But if that's truly the serial number, <laughs> no. So I might be willing to believe that could be an original 1983 Gibson Les Paul body that somebody has put a new neck on, but I would need a lot more photos of the rest of this thing. Cause it could just be that somebody messed up the installation of the pickups or maybe it was a factory second body, not actually employee crafted. And perhaps the seller of this is just using photos from when he had purchased it. Or it could be that somebody has extensive knowledge of Gibson history and decided just to stamp a serial number in the side of a cavity, just like they did back in the 80s. I would not suggest purchasing this guitar if you think it's an actual Gibson product. I mean, there's a small chance that the body could be legit, but the neck I believe is fairly certain here that it's some sort of a custom made project. And as far as a crafty level, you know, experimentation of putting stuff on, they did okay. I've seen worse custom made guitars, but it's offered at 3,500 bucks if you're interested in it. But what else do we have to talk about today? We've got a 1967 Gibson EBO. I don't know what it is about these poor Gibson bases, but they seem to get heavily modified all the time. You can check out this review and demo where I kind of talked about all the differences of the electric base models that Gibson have done. But for the most part, they've got their mud buckers and they're not all that versatile if you're trying to get like fender type bass sounds out of them. So it's quite common to find people to modify these. I mean, we still have a mud bucker style pickup up here, but then we have not one, but two sets of P bass pickups. So it's like a vintage fender style and then more active EMG style. Oh my goodness, did they really put active and passive electronics in here so they could just choose which one they wanted? I mean, as a vintage collectible, this thing is terrible now, but as a player's great instrument, this thing's got some tonal opportunities to choose from. Don't quite understand this. Why did they sink the shaft of the pot through the knob though? But this thing was cool. It was inventive. I wanted to share it with you guys and look at those new very low profile Schaller tuners on it as compared to the originals. Headstock still looks pretty good on this thing too. So how much is this player's grade EBO? Well, it's actually open auction at 370 bucks. You can't go wrong, but it's located in Alaska. So $200 shipping. I mean, that's probably about what it takes nowadays. That could be a lot of fun. Next up, we have a Ventura 70s Les Paul. So this is definitely birthed during that whole lawsuit era style guitars made as a copy of this thing, the Gibson Blonde Beauty, as some people call it. It's got the maple fretboard. It's a Les Paul custom. You can also find them in the ebony finish. And despite being a custom up here, it actually has standard inlay. So that made it a little bit interesting as well. I mean, this just looks like a really nice guitar. The headstock's fancy. It's got Gibson's open book. They have their own branding on it. That's why these 70s knockoff guitars, they're not as bad as like the Chibsons of today because A, they're vintage in their own right and have their own cult followings and sometimes they can actually be quite good. And oh my goodness, I'm just seeing this for the first time. Do you see what's on here? Spotlight special tuners or the 335S standards. So they get those pearl tips right here and then the Gibson branding. I mean, this set of tuners is like worth 300 to 500 bucks to the very right guy. Sometimes you can pick these things up cheap but that's worth some decent money. The fretboard looks nice and lacquered, should be comfortable, but oh, what, what is going on here? <laughs> I love it. I love the inventiveness of how cheap it is. So it looks like to make up these large parallelograms, 
they just cut little squares out of existing material. It's interesting. Like, like right here, you've got some large rectangles. It gives you a lot more color variation, that's for sure. But whoa, those are really tiny frets. But it looks like the routes were done pretty good. You got a cool black moto pickguard on it right now. Vintage style knobs. Our hardware's a bit aged. It's been played. They're even trying to mimic the pancake body on this. That's cool. I mean, the Gibson variation today on the vintage market between 35 to about 10 grand, depending on condition. Looks like this photo even shows that there's a belly cut on this, but they want 700 bucks. I'm not really sure what the market is for that brand, but I do know that you could take those tuners off, put just some generic locking Grovers on it and be able to knock off another 200 from that price. Let's go back into what a real Les Paul should look like. So this is a 1992 Custom Plus. Sometimes these can just have really nice tops and they've become scarce lately. So looking at this one, I think you can see what I saw was wrong with that other one. You see how small the block inlays actually get up here? They're not full width. They don't get super wide. They do start to shrink down. Now the true 50s variations, the last three are supposed to be the same, but I mean that got modernized. But this thing would probably look quite fascinating in person. This is one of those tops you can tell that it would just come to life and move. And you gotta love that early 90s big blocky logo. Very similar to the 80s as well. So that's available at 6400 Canadian or about 5000 USD. I mean, if it's in really clean shape, yeah, it's definitely worth that to the right buyer. Next up, we have a three pickup 1978. So three pickup customs in the late 70s. They do exist, but there were very few of these things made. So collectors do pay attention to these. I've actually owned at least a natural one before, but that was before I really realized, you know, just how rare that was. I mean, you can find these, you know, a couple per year. So they're not like hen's teeth or anything, but whenever one shows up in clean condition, you know, normally collector snaps it up pretty fast. Now this one looks pretty players great to me. It's got dings and scratches, but hey, it's a cool guitar. But I really like that it retained all this case candy with it this whole entire time. So you've got a price list, you've got the warranty card right here. I've definitely seen that before. It's like the, the model catalog, similar to that. I don't think I've seen this before, but this right here, you can check that out in this episode. It's a story time with Trogley. It's the uh, late 70s Gibson color manual. It tells you all about those guitars. And it still has the chainsaw case. But how much is it? 6250 which is a little bit high, but that's how you do it. You list high, you take offers. I mean, I could still see that selling in that 5000 range because of the three humbucker rarity and all that cool case candy. Because if you don't place value on this, you're incorrect. I mean, just that Gibson thing, if it's unfilled out in really clean shape, you can get 250 to 300 on it. I'm sure that price list, you know, 50 to 100, that's probably about the same on that. That book I've had success for selling between, you know, 100 bucks for a really beat up one to, I bet somebody would pay up to 500 for a really clean one yet today. So there is a little bit of a bonus right there. And then this thing. Mike and Mike's Guitar Bar, you got me all excited. 1959 Les Paul Special Double Cut Inverness Green. I was like, really? Custom color version of one of these? I am really happy because it was looking the part to me. It's got the serial number. It's got the wear and tear. I was all ready to buy this and document it because I knew original ones would generally sell between like five and 10,000 depending on condition, sometimes a bit more for color. So I was thinking, okay, a little bit of a premium for a cool custom finish. Yeah, I'm all for this. I want to document it. But then, ah, refinished, tasteful relic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if it was an actual custom color, it would probably be like 20, 25,000. So I guess I can't be too upset, but <laughs> that is a cool looking guitar if that is what you're in the market for. The people who did this refinish and relic job, they did a pretty good job on this. All right, Droglodytes, I hope you enjoyed checking out some of these cool guitars with me tonight. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.